Good evening, and thank you so much for being here, and thank you for taking time to uh, learn a little bit more about active learning. We are so pleased to have with us as part of our core Amore Mondays, Carrie Adams. Carrie Adams just completed her PhD at the University of North Texas and is now a core music education professor at Florida State University. And while we were in quarantine and everybody was scrambling, just trying to survive and keep our heads above water, Carrie did quite a bit of work in trying to learn a little bit more about how we can best connect students virtually and how we can use some of these platforms in order to help our students be able to socially stay together. We know that's such an important element during these times. So today she is sharing with us measures of active learning and ways in which we can get beyond lecture in thinking about methods, courses, and other contexts under which we teach. Please help me welcome Carrie Adams. Thank you so Ooh. much. <laughs> Thank you all for being here tonight. It's so great to see so many familiar faces, former students, former professors. Um, and some, some new faces as well. I'm so excited to get to chat with you all a little bit this evening about some of the things that I've learned in this process of um, working in this online environment. So I think we've got a lot of um, collegiate professors with us. We've also got some K-12 teachers and we've got some pre-service teachers in the room. So while my focus tonight primarily is on methods courses, I'm hoping that you'll all be able to find something that's just applicable to working in this online environment as well. Um, the first thing that I want us to think about tonight is our goals. So today we are going to be thinking specifically about how do I work to build community in these online environments? And then we're going to shift and think about some strategies that we can use to make our lectures more interactive, interspersing active learning within things where we need to have something that's more lecture based. And then finally, we're going to get to experience some active learning and some collaboration together. Um, so we'll be using some breakout rooms and some other things like that. Before we get started, I've already made a Zoom mistake. <laughs> Before we get started, I have a Google folder that I would like to share with you. Um, there's some documents in here that we'll use throughout the presentation tonight. So if you wanna click on that, you should be able to access there a couple of items um, and we'll use those a couple of times this evening. All right, so the first thing that I'd like to do is to clarify a couple of um, items of terminology when it comes to working online. Um, the first thing that we hear a lot is hybrid, hybrid teaching. So when we think about hybrid teaching, um, sometimes we hear that used to describe when I have an in-person class and then I have students who are zooming into that class or, or coming into some with some video conferencing platform. And really hybrid instruction is not that. Hybrid instruction is when I have a mix of face-to-face -face and online experiences that can be synchronous or asynchronous. So for example, my choral techniques class that I teach right now, we meet in person Monday, Wednesday, online on Friday. Students have some things they complete in person and some things that they complete online. So when we talk about hybrid teaching, that's what we're talking about tonight. The way that we generally hear that term used is what I would actually refer to as crisis teaching. So crisis teaching is what our K-12 teachers have been asked to do over these past few months. Um, with no resources, with no extra time being uh, required to have this un unsustainable situation where you have students who are in person and students who are in, who are coming in via a video conferencing platform. And we will talk about some strategies and techniques that will help with that. But before we go any further, um, K-12 teachers who are in the room, I wanted you to, to know that I am never ever saying that what you're doing is not enough or that you need to be doing more. It's so wonderful that you're here trying to think more deeply about your process, but it's also important that we recognize that this is crisis teaching um, and is really unsustainable and it's unrealistic for us to ask you to try to teach through trauma and also be this, this um, have this amazing, perfect, everything working just exactly correctly. So um, it's important, I think, that we recognize that. So we will talk a little bit about some strategies for that crisis teaching model. 
And then the other model that you'll hear a lot of people talk about, which we're not really going to touch on tonight, is high flex. If you're interested in learning more, though, this is an option. A uh, high flex class is uh, stands for hybrid flexible. So in this model, you have a completely asynchronous online course and a completely synchronous face-to-face -face course that runs simultaneously. Um, this is, again, really high expectation, probably unreasonable for most of us, but if you decide to do a high flex course, please let me know how it goes <laughs> and teach me how to do it. Um, the option with a high flex course would be then that students can choose on a weekly basis, whether they participate in face to face or online instruction. Um, so it would be great for something where students have to go in and out of quarantine. Um, but again, that's really creating two courses simultaneously. So that's not something that we'll touch on this evening. We have all had some experience then either as students or as teachers working in this online environment. So I first want to hear from you in the chat if you'll put what are some things that you have noticed that are the biggest challenges of teaching in the online environment, whether you're teaching fully online or in more of that hybrid situation or in the crisis teaching model. What are some challenges that you face teaching, moving your instruction to that online platform. Go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and you can send that either privately or publicly, whatever you prefer. Yeah, unresponsive students, lack of engagement, hmm. Providing live feedback, so challenging, absolutely. Um, motivation, doing their work outside of class. Yeah, absolutely. You got prioritizing, thanks Derek. Hi Derek. Um, prioritizing um, students who are online, who are in person, what do I do? Uh, a lot of things here about transitions and feedback and assessment. Um, yeah, Haley, belonging, making connections with them. Those things are all really challenging online, right? The little things that we do in person, like having little conversations before and after class suddenly become incredibly challenging to do online. Absolutely, yeah, connections are really, really hard. Um, so um, yeah, absolutely, yeah, TJ. So thinking about that assessment piece where it would be really easy for me to scan and do a quick formative assessment. And now that's a lot more challenging, especially if I have students who need to have their cameras off for whatever reason, trying to check in with them. Um, having them demonstrate skills. Yeah, absolutely. Using their classmates as students, right? We would rather have our students in, in person and in the schools. And that's so challenging to, can't, we can't replicate really that field experience. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I feel the same way whenever I have students who are in that crisis teaching model who are zooming in to an in person class I feel so many times I feel like I'm just ignoring them right that they're they're not even a part of what's going on. So with those things in mind, um, I want us to think about some possible solutions or things that we can do to at least ameliorate some of those issues. Um, yeah, okay, so we're going to start with that last comment that Derek put into the chat, thinking about genuine interactions with students. Um, and a lot of you also mentioned motivation and engagement. So as we go through our, our time together this evening, I want us to remember that really, when we think about motivation, motivation is this, our students are are all people in order to feel motivated need to experience these feelings of mastery, autonomy, purpose, and belonging. So I have to think about as I'm constructing my courses, how can I provide opportunities for students to experience each of those things? And as you all mentioned, belonging is one of the most challenging ones to do online. And it's so important because if I want my students to engage in any sort of active learning, whether that's in a methods class where I want them to engage in discussions or activities, or if that's in a choral classroom where I want them to feel safe singing out and participating in rehearsal, um, I have to have a healthy community established first. So how do we do this online? Well, thankfully, although we are all new to this, um, there is a vast body of literature from the distance learning um, research that we can pull from and learn from when it comes to building community in these online spaces. So here are some things that um, the research indicates can be helpful in building community. First, something very simple, um, if we're in a completely 
um, synchronous online class is to greet students by name as they come into the room. Much more challenging if you're teaching in a middle school or a high school and you have all the students pop in all at once, but trying as much as we can to just greet students and at least say hi and say their name as they're coming in so they feel like they have been welcomed into the class just like we would in person. Another thing we can think about online is finding moments of genuine connection. Moments of genuine connection, MGCs, are what they sound like. They're very small, brief interactions that we have individually with students um, that are genuine in nature and that go beyond just saying hello. So in these moments of genuine connection in a face-to-face -face classroom, normally as students come in or as they leave, I would stop and I would chat with them for just a couple of minutes to try to get to know something about them. Um, so like maybe Matt comes in one day and I say, hey Matt, how was your weekend? He's like, it's great, I have to go to Banana Republic. And I might say, oh, there's a Banana Republic in Tallahassee. And he would say, no, there's no shopping in Tallahassee. <laughs> Um, so those are little conversations that I would have as they come into the room. Those are way more difficult to do in the online setting because it doesn't happen naturally. So some ways I might facilitate those uh, moments of genuine connection online. First, I might do it by using the waiting room to meter students as they come in. So I'm only adding one student as a at a time and I have a brief moment where I can interact with that one student as they come in before another student comes into the waiting and in, in from the waiting room. Another thing I might do is have brief office hours, online office hours, and ask students to make appointments for even just for five minutes, just to stop in and say hi and get to know them and, and find out something about them. I can also embed moments of genuine connection in my feedback. And we're gonna talk in a second about a way to make that feedback happen quicker on online settings. Um, so I, instead of just giving generic feedback, I might provide something very specific to that student and try to connect with them. And I might even say, okay, I've got 30 students, 60 students, 100 students. I can't provide a, an MGC for them on every item of feedback. So maybe I just say on this particular assignment, I'm going to try to connect with five students in my feedback. And I'm going to keep track of which ones I did. And then the next assignment, I'll get five more. So thinking about how I can stagger those. Um, I could also use email or even a phone call. I might freak some of our students out if we give them a phone call, um, but shooting them a quick email and trying to connect with them that way. Um, that's another way that we can try to facilitate those connections online. So when we think about feedback and instruction, one thing that we know from the research and distance learning is that students feel more connected to the course, to the instructor and to each other when instruction and feedback happen audiovisually. So most of us are already providing that audiovisual instruction. The other thing to think about is providing audiovisual feedback. In one study, students who received written feedback, um, some students received written feedback and others received audiovisual feedback. And the students who received the audiovisual feedback were 60% more likely to listen to and implement that feedback than the ones who just got written feedback. So it's a really powerful tool. And the other reason I love it is it's so much faster. So doing a quick screen share where you can have their, um, have their work up on the screen and talk over it or even just a quick little audio clip or a quick video that you can attach, giving them feedback on their assignment is often much faster than trying to sit and type out feedback and they're more likely to listen to it and they're more likely to feel connected in that process too. Um, another thing that can be helpful is providing virtual office hours, either scheduled ones where I ask students to come in for five minutes at a time, or even just providing a Zoom link and saying, I'm going to be hanging out on Zoom for 30 minutes in this block. You can stop in anytime. Um, I have a good friend who is a music ed professor at Southeast Missouri State University, Elizabeth Hogan, and um, she often posts her office hours on her Facebook page and says, anyone who wants to stop in can stop in at this time. So that's another really great tool for connection. The other thing I want to think about in crisis teaching is creating opportunities for online and in-person students to interact with one another. So that might happen in an online space. So maybe having students upload Flipgrid videos and viewing each other's videos and commenting on them or providing an assignment where students collaborate. And I, in one group, I might have two or three in-person students and two or three online students. So just thinking of ways for those online students to interact with your in-person students so that they don't feel like they're just on the outskirts and in their own little world. 
The other thing I need to think about when it comes to building community in my classroom is the idea of psychological safety. So psychological safety is the term for when I feel safe taking risks and making mistakes. Um, when I feel safe answering questions and, and saying things in front of my peers, those kinds of things. And it's so important that we have that in order for active learning to take place. So how can I build psychological safety online? Well, the research indicates one really powerful tool for that is onboarding. So as we approach a new semester, thinking about providing an onboarding module for students that just shows them where everything is, um, gives them an overview of the course, provides videos maybe of the instructor introducing the course, um, do a screen share maybe where you're giving them a tour of Canvas or whatever your LMS is. Um, and then having a couple of sample assignments there that are for no points or for very low point value, giving them an opportunity just to navigate the system and make sure that they understand how to upload things and how to do quizzes and all of those kinds of things. Um, kind of similar to that, another thing I can do is provide lots of low stakes assessments. So just like in a face-to-face -face class to build psychological safety, I don't want to have only a midterm and a final grade, those high stakes exams that really decrease psychological safety and make it difficult for students to feel comfortable taking risks and making mistakes. Instead, providing a lot of low stakes assessments along the way. So a low stakes assessment could either be something that's a very low point value, or it could be um, something where students can redo the assignment if they make mistakes. And then again, that idea of trying to facilitate those informal conversations. They're so awkward on Zoom, right? I'm sure all of us at some point have been to a Zoom happy hour. I think that's like a level of purgatory is going to a Zoom happy hour. It's so awkward and uncomfortable because you can only have one conversation at a time. So um, thinking about how we can facilitate that is so challenging, but that might be something like as students come in, you might have a silly question that you have them answer in the chat so they can have some sort of an in informal conversation, right? I love food, so I tend towards that. Put in the chat what your favorite dessert is, what your favorite kind of pie is, um, what, your, what your favorite pet is, whatever it is, just have something that they can put in the chat and facilitate those informal conversations that way. And also as they're coming into the room, trying to facilitate those informal conversations there. Um, then the last thing to think about with psychological safety is how can I create opportunities for one-on-one -on -one or small group interactions? And again, if it's at all possible, I want those interactions to include groups of students who are in person and who are online. Um, so making sure that those online only kids in a crisis teaching model still have some sense of connection to those students who are in the room in, the room in person. Um, so that might look like using breakout rooms, um, that might look like providing collaborative assignments with a mix of inline, online and in-person students. Um, that might even look like just having students send private chats to one another. So you have a partner and we do like a think pair share model. Um, maybe Leslie is my partner and so I'm going to go to chat and I'm going to just select Leslie and send my, my chat just to her and she can send it just to me so we can have some one-on-one -on -one interactions that way. All right, so this is a this session is called Beyond Lecture, and so far all I've done is lecture. <laughs> so let's think about some ways that we can go beyond that lecture in the classroom. Um, and the one great way to do that, I think, is to use a model called interactive lecture. So interactive lecture is lecture that's interspersed with moments of active learning. When I think about lecture in the online environment, I have to think about two really important questions as I plan. One is how much can I cover with the appropriate pace? And the other is how long can I reasonably expect students to maintain attention? So in the, <laughs> that's right, Leslie, <laughs> it does make them perk up. I saw your eyes. <laughs> Um, so in the chat, I want you to put your thoughts. How much can I cover, do you think, appropriately on Zoom? Like, can I cover more than I can in person, less, about the same? What has your experience been? Or you could also answer the question about your student's attention span. Is the attention span more or less or about the same on Zoom? Yeah, I'm not sure which question you're answering, but I think the answer to both is less. Yeah, absolutely. So it takes longer to deliver instruction on online. Absolutely. Um, the recommendation I saw is that you should plan for about 80% of what you would normally cover on in person. 
is about how much you should cover it on Zoom. So one of the most challenging things for me was at the very beginning, I would plan a normal lesson and then Haley and Matt are my TAs, so they can attest to this. I would run out of time very, very quickly. Um, so thinking about what would I normally do now trim it down by about 20%. And then also your students are at home, there are people, there are pets, they're on a device where they can access social media. There are so many more distractions. So my attention span is probably gonna be a lot less too when we're in that online environment. So with those things in mind, um, I can use some strategies from interactive lecturing to help with that. The first strategy that we can use is overlays. So if you look in the Google Drive, um, one item that you'll see there is the, um, the sample note guide. I'll pull that up. Can you all see, see my screen still as well? So you can see that on my screen or in the Google Doc. So I like, I like to use note guides a lot. These are, this is an example of an overlay for a lecture. A lot of our students struggle with um, taking notes. They've just never learned how to take notes effectively. And so they tend to just try to write down everything on the slide or write down everything that we say um, instead of really absorbing and thinking through the information. So a note guide provides an option, kind of a structure for them to help direct their attention toward the items that are the most important. So I might do something very specific. So this is really important. I want my students to know those four components of motivation. So I've highlighted that here um, in a really distinct way. Here, I want, them to, I want them to just kind of think, what are the strategies that she talked about that I wanna use in my classroom? So that's much more open. So a note guide is an overlay option that really helps with um, student attention throughout the, throughout the lesson because they're able to focus on a particular thing. The other two elements of interactive lecture are interleaves and bookends. And we're gonna practice some of these. So here are four interleaves that I like to use. I'll describe them and then we're gonna do one of them together. Um, so interleaves are just kind of what they sound like. They're things that you weave within the lecture. So I might lecture for five minutes, do an interleave activity, lecture for 10 minutes, do an interleave activity. Here's some that I really like. One of them is make a connection. So maybe I say, um, okay, so we are talking today about motivation. What are some concepts that we worked on last week that are related to motivation? Or what's something that you learned about in your psychology of music class that connects to, to what we talked about today? Or if I'm in a middle school choir, I might say, all right, we're working on the rule of the phrase with Shoshone Love Song. What are some other pieces that we could apply the rule of the phrase to? Make a connection there. So those little transfer moments can happen as interleaves in your lesson. Another one that we use really commonly is think, pair, share in the in-person classroom, and it really translates nicely to online. So with a think, pair, share, I give them a question. I ask them to think or write about it for a second. Then they talk about it with a partner, and then we talk about it as a full group. So that partner piece online could be uh, breakout rooms or you could have an assigned partner that you send a private chat to and discuss with them on private chat. And then we share it all together and we're gonna talk about some strategies for full group sharing in a minute. Uh, the third interleave I like to use is a real world application. So maybe we're talking about classroom management and I say, all right, you have a kid who comes in and they're really upset and they pick up their binder and they throw it. What are you going to do? Think about what we talked about in class today. Um, so having them create, take the concepts and then apply them to a real world situation. And then the fourth one that I really like to do is the one I'm gonna ask us to experience together. And that's the one sentence summary. So I'll pause um, partway through a lecture and I'll say, okay, we've talked about a lot of things so far. Um, and I want you to think what right now, if you were gonna take everything we've talked about and you were gonna summarize it into one sentence, how would you distill our conversation so far tonight into a single sentence? So I'll give you about a, a minute to think about it and type it into the chat. And while you're doing that, I'll send you the correct link. So one sentence summary, what we have talked about so far this evening. And put that in the chat.
there's a link to the folder. Sorry about that. All right, I see some good sentences coming in about crisis teaching, about building community, about student engagement, about um, wheel drivers, building connections. Good, great, keep them coming. So that's what a, um, oh, thank you, Sarah. I know how to use the internet. Let's try this one more time because you're gonna need it in a second. There, try that one for me. Okay, good. All right, so that is an example of an interleave. So an interleave again is just something that I put into the middle of um, a rehearsal or a lesson, something that can be used transitionally or it can be used to assess and make sure that students are all on the same page with you. The other thing that I can do uh, for interactive lecturing is called a bookend. So does anyone have a guess? Put it in the chat as to what a bookend might be. If interleaves happen in the middle of your lesson, what might a bookend be? Yeah, it can happen at the end or at the beginning. That's exactly right. Good. So a bookend is a, just something, a strategy you put at the beginning or the end. Um, so here are some bookends that I really like to use, and we might use one of them tonight. Who knows? Um, the first one is a prediction revision. So asking students saying, well, this is a concept that we're going to talk about today. Predict what you think this is. Um, you can use this for definitions. You can use this for concepts. You can use this for a lot of different things. And then at the end, you ask students to revise their prediction. So let's say that I'm teaching sixth grade choir and we are going to work on the rule of the slur. And I might say, okay, today we're working on the rule of the slur. Predict, what do you think the rule of the slur is going to be? And students could write on a piece of paper their prediction if they're in person, or they could put it in the chat if they're online. And then at the end of the lesson, you could have them revise their prediction. We know that people are more likely to remember things when they make predictions, especially if they make an incorrect prediction and then have it fixed. Um, so that's a really great bookend to use. Another one I like to use at the end of class is team note revisions. So students use their overlay, their note guides throughout the, throughout the class. And then at the end, we might move into breakout rooms. And I would say, go through your notes together and see if there are things that you missed that someone else in your group got and revise your notes. So again, this is creating those revisions really helps things to stick in our memory. Another bookend I can use is a pre-post free write. Um, so I, again, can give them an open-ended item and ask them to respond to it before the class. And then after the lecture, once we've had the conversation, they, they revise it or write about how their opinion changed. So for example, we talked about classroom management last week, and I opened with a story about an, an experience that I had in the classroom, and I asked them to write about how they would handle that situation. And then at the end of the lecture, after we had talked about classroom management, I asked them to do a second writing, and then they were supposed to say what they would change about their response, what they would keep the same about their response. Um, the last two that I love using are the biggest takeaway and the absent colleague. So biggest takeaway is similar to one sentence summary. At the end of class, I'll say, um, will you write down what you think the number one most important thing that we talked about? What was your biggest takeaway from tonight's class? Or I might choose to have them select three items, whatever it is, but having them prioritize what was the most important thing we talked about. And then absent colleague is where I might say, okay, you're gonna go into breakout rooms now with a partner. And I want you to pretend that your partner was not in class today. Catch them up, tell them what they missed. So both of those again, are just getting students to kind of synthesize and summarize what it was that we talked about in class. So with all of those items, I really need to be able to foster a discussion for my students, which we talked about at the beginning is another big challenge of online instruction. So what I want us to do in our last few minutes together is to experience some active learning techniques and then some discussion about it. Um, so here are some strategies that we might use in that process. The first thing is the reaction buttons. So I might ask um, someone to share a thought and then I'll say, if you agree with that person or if you had a similar thought, use the clap or the thumbs up reaction. I think this is really powerful because when we're in the classroom in person, 
if someone starts to talk, they see like people nodding and saying, yes, I agree with that. Right. And that in this environment where everyone's on mute and not, we can't see everyone's faces. It can be scary to start to talk. And then you aren't getting that verbal, that nonverbal feedback of whether or not people agree with you. So providing that through reactions can be really helpful for building that psychological safety and helping people feel comfortable with those conversations. I can also alternate between public chat and private chat. So in a minute, we're gonna do an activity and I'm gonna ask you to send me your response in private chat first. Um, and I can use that to help if students are unsure, if I'm asking them a really challenging question and maybe they are uncomfortable answering it in front of their peers, if I'm asking them to make a prediction, and then I can select items from the private chat to share. And then we've talked about this already, but using an online think pair share as well is a really helpful tool for discussion. In crisis teaching, um, if you have some students who are online and some who are in person, if you can have a student uh, monitor the chat for you. So I, in my choral techniques class, um, my TA Matt, who's here tonight, he monitors the chat. So he's my Zoom person and um, he has our Zoom pulled up and he is with my Zoom students and can interact with them and respond to them in the chat. And if they have something they wanna say, he raises his hand and I call on him and then he lets them know um, that they can unmute themselves. So providing those opportunities to kind of help those students feel like they're still engaged in the process. Um, I'm very fortunate to have a TA to do that, but you can also have a student do that. Um, and if you have a, a student who's in person and you could even rotate. So every student gets a chance to monitor the chat and interact with their colleagues who are on that online platform. All right, so let's do some active learning together. Um, so this is a, an activity that I really like to do with my choral technique students. We are, you know, we're not in the schools and there's not a way for us to replicate that experience of being with students in person. Um, so I want to try to start building their ear anyway. And so one of the ways that I'll do that is by asking them to um, complete this exercise. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to play a little bit of Shoshone love song. That's why it was on my brain. Um, by a, a middle school choir performing this. And I'm gonna ask you the following question. If you had 15 minutes to clinic this choir based on what you hear in this little snippet, what is the one thing that you would focus on in that 15 minutes? You have to pick one, only one thing that would be your focus for that 15 minutes. And you should also be prepared to discuss how you might go about working toward that goal. So what I'd like you to do is as you listen, decide what is the one thing you would work on and send it just to me in a private chat. So make sure that your chat is set so that it's just sending to Carrie Adams. Um, and I'm gonna play just about 30 seconds of it. We'll do a quick version tonight. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear it. Thank you. Let's clap for the kiddos. Great job. Okay, um, so send it to me in private chat if you haven't already. What's the one thing that you would choose to work on? Okay, so as those are coming in, um, we're going to do a sample discussion using the reactions. So what I'm going to do is call on one person from the chat. I'm going to ask you to share what your primary goal is going to be for that choir. If you also had that as your primary goal, then you're going to use the clap reaction. It's all practice. So we're going to clap if that was what you also selected as your primary goal. And if you agree with that person, but you would focus on something else, then you're going to give us the thumbs up. Okay. So if I call on Haley 
um, and she shares her item, then she is going to share her item, watch the reactions, and she's going to call on someone who gave the thumbs up reaction. Okay. All right. You ready, Haley? Yes. So I would work on vowels. So clap if you also chose that, a thumbs up if you chose something else. All right, Haley, pick a thumbs up person. Sam. Hello, I said that I would work on phrase shaping and dynamics. Clap if you had the same thing, thumbs up if you had something different as your primary. All right, Sam, go ahead and call in someone with the thumbs up. Melanie. Okay, so um, I had um, working on vowels as well, just getting a little bit more depth and some space and some warmth in there. All right, clap if you had the same thing. Thumbs up if you had something different. Let's do one more, Melanie, call in a thumbs up. Let's do Adam. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Great, thank you. Um, I had a uh, phrase shape and uh, just syllabic stress. All right, clap if you agree, thumbs up if you had something else. Okay, perfect. And so then we could expand this also to, instead of just telling us what it was that you would work on, giving us tools that you would use. So maybe Melanie says, this is what I'm gonna work on. And then she calls on someone who gave a thumbs up who says a tool that she could use to work on that concept. Um, and I could work on this with my middle school or high school singers too, getting them to refining their ears, getting them to listen in different ways and think about what are the concepts we've been working on in class that we could work on with this choir and their sound. Um, so it's a really fun way to facilitate those discussions. The next thing I want us to think about is how can I effectively use breakout rooms? So we are gonna use some breakout rooms together today with that hexagonal thinking document. Um, so if you have that Google, Google Drive folder pulled up and you see the one that says example hexagonal thinking, we're gonna use that together in just a minute. So when it comes to using breakout rooms, a lot of problems that students have are, I don't know what to do once I get there, I forget what the directions were, and then we as the teacher have no way to monitor what's happening in the breakout rooms. Um, so some things that help with both of those items, first of all, using Google Docs for your students to collaborate on whenever they're in breakout rooms. So if you see that example hexagonal thinking, you'll see four or five Google slides there that are set up and ready to go. And you'll notice on those Google slides, I have the activity I want students to do. And I also have directions and I have indication of which breakout room is on each slide. So the great thing about this is then I send my students into their breakout rooms and I watch Google slides and I can monitor what's happening in each of those breakout rooms in real time. So I can see if there's nothing happening on slide four that maybe I need to join breakout room four for a minute. Um, I also can type directly onto the slides document and give them feedback really quickly. So if I have students who are doing something that's not exactly what I was looking for, I might just go into their document and say, hey, group three, I see that you're doing this. This is what I meant instead and I type that directly onto their document so I can give them feedback in real time. I also wanna make sure that I place the instructions everywhere. So I'm gonna have a slide that has the directions on it on my PowerPoint. Then I'm gonna also put the directions in the chat. And then I'm also gonna have it in their collaboration document. And then once in their, they're in their breakout rooms, I'm gonna send it a, a broadcast message too. So they're gonna get those directions a million times. Um, I'm going to use the broadcast function of breakout rooms to give them those instructions at the beginning 
and then to also give them time markers. So you have five minutes left, or you should be at this point now giving them those benchmarks as they work to keep them going. And I can also provide clarification. So if I see on the Google slides that everyone is misunderstanding this one thing, I might just go in the breakout room um, in the broadcast function and say to everyone, hey, this is a clarification based on what I'm seeing. The other issue with breakout rooms that I run into all the time is just not allowing enough time. So we talked about this at the beginning, right? Everything just takes longer. And so that collaboration takes longer as well. And before I was using the Google Docs to do this, I was cutting my students off really regularly. Um, so the other thing I like about this is I can see what their progress is. And maybe I thought this is gonna take 10 minutes and maybe they need 20 minutes to do it. And I can see that progress happening in real time and adjust my plan accordingly. Um, so here's some examples of how I've used the, have a, a Google Docs and Google Sheets and Google Slides to facilitate these collaborations. So this slide that you see was um, my freshman class, their first experience with lesson planning. Um, and we use the Kodai inspired lesson plan. So we use the high concentration, change of pace, et cetera. So I have each rehearsal chunk outlined for them. And then in the speaker notes for the Google slides, I put their directions. And I also said, so this was their first experience. So I gave them, these are, these, this is the rep that you're covering. These are your goals. And all they had to do was copy it and paste it into the correct spot in the lesson plan. Another way that I use that is then when they're doing their, um, their group teaching, their first lesson plan, each group had their own document and they put who was teaching what, and they put their little lesson plan there and what their strand was for the day. And I could watch all of those documents as they were working in the class. My favorite thing I've ever done for a methods class is something that I actually stole from a middle school English language arts teacher. So this is definitely applicable no matter what level or content you teach. Um, we know when we're teaching that the thing we want our students to do is to make connections. And this activity is all about making connections and it all happens on Google Slides. So we are gonna move into breakout rooms um, here and for just a couple minutes, I'm gonna break one of the rules I just said and you are not gonna have time to finish this activity but I wanted you to at least experience it for a little bit. So here's how hexagonal thinking works. In the Google Slides document, you'll see a bunch of hexagons it looks like the old game show Blockbusters. And um, you'll see some terms down there at the bottom, terms that you might cover in a choral methods course. So I've got this set up for choral methods, but if you're working with middle school, high school, choir, band, orchestra, it could be musical concepts that you've covered. Um, you could even list pieces, titles of pieces that you've worked on. And my goal then for my students is to take those terms and place them in hexagons in such a way that all terms that touch each other are connected. And I'm gonna ask my students then to explain why they made the connections that they did. So here's a sample of what hexagonal thinking looks like in the middle of the process. So my students started to move items and then they had conversations in their breakout rooms about how classroom culture is related to feedback and how classroom culture is related to the independence hierarchy and how feedback and the independence hierarchy are related to each other. So you see every item that is touching has to be connected in some way. And then in the speaker notes, they started to outline their thoughts about what those connections were. So we are going to move into breakout rooms. Um, does everyone have access to the hexagonal thinking document? Okay, um, so once you're in your breakout room, I'm gonna put that link in the chat again. Once you're in the breakout room, check which room you're in. If you're in room one, you'll be on slide one, room two, slide two, et cetera. And you're gonna have that conversation and start to make some movements happen on those hexagonal thinking items. All right, we'll just do this for about five minutes and then we'll come back and close. All right, so Troy, we've got um, four slides ready to go. So if you could break us into four breakout rooms, that would be great. I would have to manually join one. 
<laughs> no, that's fine. Let's see. I'm just gonna, I want to go watch the process, so I'll see you in a minute. Okay. Ready. Hi. Hello. Hello, Troy. I thought y'all would be done by now. What are you doing over here? <laughs> so we're supposed to be on slide three? Yeah. Okay. Oh, now I see we got things moving here. Let's... Are we going to collaborate? Or are we just going to randomly start moving stuff? <laughs> 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 Let go of that. That's fine. I think voicing a choir would have a lot to do with uh, adolescent voice change. So I'm going to put those next to each other, but I'm going to put them in the corner. If mine changed slides, I was suddenly grabbing somebody else's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I keep changing slides. <laughs> Wait. Me too. I wonder if it's my mouse because it scrolls. So who's, are we just moving things without talking about them? I think we're all just randomly moving things. <laughs> <laughs> who, who can, who can take control of, <laughs> of this situation? Okay, I'm in a meeting. I'll, I'll, um, I'll be done in like 15 minutes. Okay. These all I seem so broad. I feel this. like these are all yeah. very related. That's because you're a good transfer thinker. Well, thank you. All right, well, <laughs> we're putting things on there. Whoever the Whoever the tiger is, is very busy. Oh, does it identify who has what? It says anonymous tiger is whoever the user is that's moving a bunch of stuff around. I don't know what that is. Oh, that, I think I might be the tiger. Arr! We'll just throw everything on there. All right. <laughs> I think we're done then. <laughs> here's, here's a fun thing we could do. Rotate some things around. <laughs> Change fonts. Do we have any thoughts on what's already on there? I have a hard time uh, not connecting these, uh, putting things toward the edge. What do we think belongs toward the edge? Voicing, maybe. We've already got on the outside. Hmm. I feel like this is a great example of my classes with all of us sort of sitting here in silence. Yes. I hear the crickets and the, the cicadas. I feel like move classroom culture and intrinsic motivation just because psychological safety also goes with your classroom culture. Possibly. But I guess so there's so much that goes with classroom culture as well. But I guess when I think of psychological safety, I just think of that as something you absolutely have to incorporate into your classroom culture. I don't know. Yeah, I like here's, that. Here's, here's my tip. Lately, I have been, every time I open my Zoom, I, ha I already have ambient music going uh, yeah. in order to get a feeling of like, there's something happening in this Zoom. It's not just, <laughs> it's just you know, it doesn't echo every time you talk. That's a good tip. I've been writing like crazy. I, I assume we're getting a handout or something, but I like have been everything she said. I'm like right, scrawling it down as fast as I this can. Will, this will be up on the website eventually. Yeah, so. I know. But... Yeah. Facebook has been broken lately, though. I haven't been able to upload our videos. Oh. But the YouTube is still there. I don't know if I think that rehearsal guides and adolescent voice change are the most welcome. <laughs> I, I mean, 
I certainly could find a connection between them, but I don't know if they're the most well connected. Well, are, are we? Are, shouldn't it be that the ones that are on the outside are the least connected? No, everything that's touching has to be connected to whatever it's touching. So adolescent voice change and rehearsal guides are touching. Right, but I'm saying like we would think that the ones that are in the middle would be really obviously well, right, connected independent to lots of stuff. has one, two, three, four, six things that touch it. Exactly. But everything else only has like three things that it touches. Mm. But I agree with you. <laughs> now we're just messing with formatting. <laughs> well, these bo the boxes are bothering us. Alyssa, how are you this evening? I'm good. I'm enjoying the session. It's a little easier when you're not running it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, always. I was just looking at everybody. I would I would move maybe psychological safety to where independent musicianship is. I know that screws everything else up, but like thinking about what's central, what is going to be the most connected thing to yeah. content. Yep. Mm -hmm. I wonder uh, if I'm going to I'm going to leave because I'm not sure that uh, she has the ability to close these rooms. That's true. So that's a good point. I don't know, can, how do I get out? At the bottom, leave room. Oh, there we go. I'm looking at the breakout room thing. All right. Are you ready for them to come back, or are they? Yes. <laughs> I was thinking, may she may not have the ability to. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they're closing. They've got sixty seconds. Okay. All right. Here they come back. That was a very quiet room that I jumped into. I thought I, if I went into a room that I knew the people, it would be yeah. a little more active, and it was not. It was very quiet. What room were you in? I was when there was Sam Spears and and Leslie Mann and Alyssa Cossie, and it was. It's very quiet and Haley. I don't, I don't know Haley, but they were silently moving things around. <laughs> and I am definitely an extrovert, so I was like, Hey, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, just that's great. Nobody was talking back <laughs> anyway. I told them my tip was to I always play music uh, for my Zoom sessions, yeah. <laughs> There they are. All right. What room were you guys in? This is my room. <laughs> room three. Three. Y'all were like on it. <laughs> that was Troy. He was just moving things. Like <laughs> Relates to everything. You can transfer anything, right? <laughs> That's right. All right. So I hope that was an enjoyable process for you. Of course, with, with my students, that takes like 20 to 30 minutes to go through that process and to have those conversations. And then I ask them to put in the speaker notes explanations for each connection that they made. Um, and then when they come back in, we talk about what the process was like, where they ran into barriers and things that didn't all of a sudden, oh no, this hexagon doesn't fit. I have to move something around. So um, really great tool to use. And of course, just using the Google Drive like is so helpful for monitoring what's going on in those breakout rooms. So. So again, as we close, just thinking about no matter what kind of experience I'm setting up for my students, whether it's online hybrid crisis teaching or in person, that my students, what they really want is to feel known, valued, and respected. And what they want to experience are opportunities for mastery and belonging and autonomy and purpose. Um, and so as I'm constructing those experiences, I just wanna keep all those things in the forefront of my mind at all times. I wanna thank you all again so much for being here, for taking so much time out of your evening. I hope, I sincerely hope that you'll leave here with at least one thing that's gonna be helpful for you as you move forward. Um, and I am happy to stick around if you have questions or comments. Um, I'd love to talk to you. So please let me know. And thank you all again so much. Thank you so much, Carrie.